Have you ever noticed that at the beginning of every raid tier, your DPS is significantly lower than even a couple weeks in, or a couple months in of course? Now, why is that? Well, the obvious answer would be of course gear. And while gear does make you do a lot more damage, and especially with your entire raid getting geared and then fight durations being lower, but the real biggest difference that contributes to everything along with the gear is how you deal with boss mechanics and how you go about DPSing and min-maxing everything you can with the boss. That's why every tier since Molten Core, I've released in-depth guides for every raid just to go over exactly how to parse for every boss. And today I'm gonna do the early version just to kind of help you guys out with what to look out for as you're starting to do these new raid tiers, Black Temple and Mount Hyjal. So today we're starting with Black Temple and we're gonna go boss by boss, breaking down exactly what you wanna be thinking about, where you wanna be positioning and what you wanna be focused on to do as much damage as possible. But before we get into things, I want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which I think is perfect for the video, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is a turn-based RPG for both your phone and your computer, featuring over 600 different champions, where you can go on campaign missions, PvP arenas, and even clan boss battles. Just like in Phase 3 with new bosses coming out, Raid has a brand new clan boss that will take different strats and different team comps to deal with. The Hydra. The Hydra is a menacing giant monster with six different heads, each with unique abilities, making it basically six different boss battles all in one. For example, the Head of Mischief. It steals your party's buffs and spreads them out to the other heads, so you have to time your buffs so that they run out before this head gets a turn. Then there's the Head of Decay, probably the scariest and hardest to deal with. He makes it so that every time you heal, that champion actually loses some of its max HP, and it's a nightmare. But if that wasn't enough to deal with, this head also puts a shield over one of the other heads. And if you don't break it in time, that head will get fully healed. And I think we all know how unfortunate it is when a boss gets full heal off. What I like about this game is each encounter takes actual strategy to overcome. And the game's always being updated. With new faction wars like the Crypt and this month's super limited edition champion, the esports legend Simple. All you have to do to get him is just log on for seven consecutive days between now and the 28th. There's seriously never been a better time to get started. And if you use my link in the description or scan my QR code on screen, you'll get a free starter pack worth almost $30 to kickstart your game. We're talking a free champion, Ina, 200k silver, an energy refill and an XP boost, and one ancient shard so that you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. Once you log in, all these treasures will be waiting for you right here on the screen, so download the game and get raiding today. Okay, so diving in boss by boss, let's pump these out. Hi, Warlord Nagentis. Use your cooldowns as well as Bloodlust on pull on this boss. You wanna be pumping early on and the boss is relatively short. If you end up holding your cooldowns too much, you might actually have them up when the boss becomes immune to damage during his bubble phase, and that's not good. Don't waste any damage or any cooldowns or any mana if you have to while the boss is bubbled, and try to time some big abilities to hit him right as he comes out of that. And ideally, your guild will actually try to break the bubble as soon as possible. That means having the raid already topped up because it does do 8,000 damage to the entire raid. So you do want to heal up everyone very quickly during this phase and then break the bubble because every second of downtime is lowering your DPS. For hunters, this is a really good fight for melee weaving and that's pretty much it so far. On to Supremus. Make sure you're using a Demon Slaying Elixir if you're a physical DPS, because he is obviously a demon. Use your CDs early again because you don't want to be using them during the phase two where he's fixating on someone and you actually have a lot of downtime. A big thing that's going to catch you off guard early on is his hitbox is tiny. You have to get extremely close to the boss to actually hit him, especially if you're melee DPS, but even for range, you have to be really close to the boss, way closer than you actually think because of how huge he is. If you yourself or your pet is top four on threat, it will die and it actually will even die during the actual fixate phase. So make sure you taunt your pet during this phase, especially if you see it anywhere on the threat meters. It can randomly just turn around and kill the pet before you even have the chance to taunt it. Run away from the volcanoes fast because they do a ton of damage as well as watch out for the fires, but hopefully you won't have to do too much moving because that actually is downtime and you're not doing more DPS. And during the fixate phase, you don't have to actually be running the entire time. You can actually use quite a few abilities during this phase, even if he's chasing you. And ideally, if he's fixating on a tank or a tank can get enough threat, then you can actually just face tank him during this phase, which will make it so that you actually don't have to move at all and your tank can just be hard tanking. Shade of Akama. Have your guild keep one of the Ash Tongue Battle Lords alive from the pull right before Akama. These guys have a ton of HP, and what you're gonna wanna do is then have your tank actually tank them directly underneath where the shade actually is. You can see my tank is kind of messing this up because we had a new tank this day and we were kind of explaining it. 
what you're going to do from there is have all of your warlocks just seed off of this mob if you have a high warlock comp everything is basically going to die instantly now if the channelers are dying slowly you're actually going to want to use your abilities during this phase for more overall dps on this fight but that's kind of dependent on one of two things, and I'll get into that in a second. You can actually drop combat during the transition between killing the channelers and fighting actual Akama as the shade is walking. Now, this is really useful for the first trinket swap in the raid if you want to actually just drop combat or get any food buff or anything you need to do, just get everything set up for fighting actual shade. When you do fight shade himself, he's face tanked by Akama, so just do as much damage as you can to him. One thing to note though, is that Warcraft Vlogs is kind of bugged on this fight right now, and almost every time it says that you've wiped and done like 200 dps we're not sure yet if warcraft logs is going to count the actual damage to the channelers on this fight or just the damage to the boss himself so this might change if you're parsing where you're going to actually use your cooldowns if it's just on the boss himself you'll actually save those because you don't actually need them for the channelers and then you're going to just use them all on the boss doing some insane dps on this short short fight taren gorfiend Again, you're going to use your CDs on pull this fight. Just watch your threat a little bit. If you do over aggro, then you're basically going to die. But you're going to use your CDs right away. This is a pretty short fight. You might get your two minute CDs back towards the end of the fight, especially if your DPS is a little lower. You probably won't get your three minute CDs back. Don't worry if you're not number one on the damage meters though, because the people that get the debuff that turns them into a ghost actually do appear on the damage meters as well as on the logs, and they do insane DPS, like 3.5k to 4k DPS if they're playing well. Other than that, ideally position yourself on the far end of the room, kind of where the boss is pulled from himself, because it gives you the most room to be away from the shades when they do spawn, so that they don't come and actually kill you, and you don't have to actually move for any downtime. And from there, just kind of hope, I guess, that you do get the debuff because the amount of damage you can do right now is more than you can do with our current gear so if that is actually how logs are recorded then you would get the highest parses just from having the debuff reliquary of souls pump everything and cooldowns right at the beginning of the boss potentially not bloodlust but everything else you are actually unable to pull threat on this boss during phase one so just don't even worry about that at all that being said melee do want to make sure that they're standing at max melee range so they don't pull aggro of the boss because it actually happens by being the closest one to his hitbox you're not getting mana back during this phase and you can't heal so don't worry about that just make sure dispels are going out and you're pumping the boss now in between the transitions right at the beginning of it if you're a hunter you can actually feign death and drop combat so you can do a trinket swap and the transitions are long enough to give you your two minute cds back for this fight each phase phase two he does a damage reflect mechanic where you're taking damage every time you hit him this does knock back your cast and it does grief your dps now after some testing it feels a little bit better as a hunter if i'm standing as close as possible to the boss during this phase it feels like i get a little bit less knockback other than that pump all your cds as well as bloodlust during phase three bring the boss down and collect your loot Gertog Blood Boil. Range groups don't actually need to stand that far away from the boss, and that's something you're going to see in a lot of guides that might be misleading for trying to do more damage. One advantage here is it makes it a lot easier if anyone dies for melee to sub into the stacks. They can actually move a lot shorter of a distance and keep doing more damage. One thing that's huge as well is that you can actually bop the person that's being fixated during phase two, and the boss will still be aggroed onto them, although they won't be doing any damage to them. This is huge and especially massive if you're a caster because you can just keep doing your damage dealing abilities. Now it's suggested to use your cooldowns during phase two when he's fixated on someone because you actually don't build any threat. This is also nice because if you get fixated, you do a ton more damage. So if you're actually using your cooldowns during fixation, then you're just absolutely blasting this boss but it is a little bit of a gamble and a little bit of RNG. It actually might be better more consistently to use your cooldowns on pull and then get them up one more time later in the fight. The only thing here is this fight is very heavy on threat, so make sure you're watching out for that at all times. Mother Shiraz, probably one of the most entertaining fights in here and one of the most semi-controversial. I've said it before and I think I would always suggest at least early on aiming for 174 shadow resistance. This with priest buff will give you 50% shadow resist and you won't die. The biggest thing to do on this fight is to make sure you don't die. That really is all it is. This isn't a fight that's a DPS race or a DPS check, just make sure you don't die. Now we will absolutely see people using zero shadow resistance as well as just goblin rocket boots to pump as much damage as possible but this is very RNG and you most likely will die especially early on during the first few weeks. Moving straight on to Illidari Council. 
Make sure your DPS are keeping debuffs up on every boss that's important to you, mainly the rogue boss and the paladin boss. This means once the rogue comes out of vanish, getting sunders back up, it is annoying, but it is a huge DPS increase. Try to tank these bosses on top of each other because you can do a massive amount of damage with cleave, and this is going to be really important. Watch out for everything on the ground. This is always gonna be kind of the most annoying and make sure you're moving before you actually finish any casts. It's more important to live on this fight than it is to do damage. I save my instant cast abilities like Arcane Shot for whenever I have to move out of anything on the ground. The Rogue Boss has very low armor. I think it's 400, but I'm not exactly sure on that, but I'm pretty sure Fight Club has it all figured out. So you can pump actually insane DPS, physical DPS into this boss, especially if the main Paladin boss has his Devotion Aura where he's taking less damage from physical damage. Now the only downside here is the rogue will randomly vanish and then you won't be attacking anything. So just be ready to switch back really quickly. It's slightly less important to have full debuffs on him, but just enough to get his armor down to zero. And from there again, just make sure you're staying alive. It's a very healing heavy and damage heavy fight. Illidan Storm Rage, a really fun fight and a really interesting one if you're trying to DPS. The only things you need to worry about phase one are if you get the Parasite and then you just need to run out as it's about to spawn. Don't run out early, you're gimping your DPS by having too much downtime. Make sure you get far enough away for your range to be able to kill these adds before they reach the raid. This is something you also still need to worry about in the last phase of the boss. Right on pull, again, you're going to use all of your CDs, but not Bloodlust. Now you might see one Bloodlust being used on the Infernal Sage on your Pumper group. This is because it's the hardest stage of the fight and if you can get it done fast, Faster, then you're more likely to kill the boss. During phase two, make sure you're not standing in any fire and watch out for the eye beam Right as he lands after this phase, you're going to use all of your bloodlust. You can actually hard burn this boss all the way down to 30% and hard skip his actual demon phase. So the most annoying phase during this fight is the demon phase where you actually have to DPS the demons and you're not really pumping into the boss. Just make sure you can bring him down if you have enough DPS to ignore this entire mechanic. From there, the boss is pretty simple. He hits your tanks hard, but you don't need to worry about that. Again, you're still watching out for parasites and making sure they're not taking over the raid, but you're just basically pumping the boss. And that's it, guys. That's everything you need to focus on as a DPSer during this raid. One other thing, I guess, for Nijantis is to watch out if people near you actually have the spike on them. Just grab that. And if possible, use it as soon as you see the raid at full HP. From there, good luck on loot. This phase has the highest amount of contested loot and huge items out of any phase in all all of World of Warcraft Classic, so hopefully there isn't too much drama within your raid. We already saw quite a few glaives drop on the PTR, so good luck to you guys on that one as well. If you like this guide and you want to see the Mount Hyjal one or anything else about Hunters or TBC, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you guys all on the next one.